William James. Okay. And, and I'm going to say a little bit about William James and 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 quote from Varieties of Religious Experience. So yeah. that might might well uh, give you a, a, a starting point for your your dialogue. Very um, good. I like that. Yes. Um, and and I I'll, I'm going to check check up the um I'll check the thing, but I I will basically um leave you to it and, and jump in if I feel this. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> yes, any, that's fine. But I'm sure you won't be stalling. No, um, no. Yeah. So I I've got a little bit to say about William James. Um and. Excellent. Uh, we'll we'll take it from there, and we All can right. until eleven thirty just talking. Do we? Yes, yes. Mm, so yeah. you've got a, a long conversation, proper yeah. conversation. It's Excellent. Very let's, nice. Yes. Let's <laughs> um, let's go then. Okay. Off we go. All going in. Yeah, that's it. Welcome, everyone, to day two of the 2023 Beyond the Brain conference on further researches of consciousness research. I'm Jerome Bullard, and I'll shortly hand over to David Lorimer, who will introduce Ian and Rupert. And as usual, just to let you know, this is being recorded, and you'll get the uh, recordings email later on. And as usual, if you could please just open your chat box and just type in the country or location where you are calling in from. Well, London. Well, it's very fast. <laughs> England, Norway, Hexham, Kansas. Well, Jordan, I thought that Nigeria. A very early start for our US. Wow. But California, my God, it's about four o'clock in the morning. Like <laughs> Denver, right in it. Texas. It's about three o'clock in the morning. Three a.m. Wow. Al Richardson. My goodness. There's dedication Nebraska. for you. <laughs> Lots from America. Wow. Thank yeah. you very much, everyone. And five a.m. Gosh. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And over to you, David. Thanks very much, Jerome, and welcome, everyone. Uh, my brother-in-law, Alistair McWhirter, once wrote a short story where he said, the boys got up earlier than anyone has ever got up before. Um, and that <laughs> seems to apply to um, some of our um, dedicated uh, attenders from the US. I'm going to light a candle uh, first before I say anything else. And I've got a match that works today. Hopefully. Yes, there we are. Good. So um, a warm welcome to this dialogue with um, Rupert Sheldrake and Ian McGilchrist. Uh, I've known Ian and Rupert for over 40 years, and so our connection goes back a long way. And uh, I'd like to um, start with just a remark or two on reading. Uh, and this comes from the obituary this week in The Telegraph. Uh, of John Thorne, um, who was headmaster of Winchester when I was teaching there and when Ian was a pupil. And in 1981, he was chairman of the headmaster's conference. Uh, and he said, um, uh, I do see a cloud bigger than a man's hand in the decline of reading, he told HMC. If it is not done at school, it may never be done. And I think this is a you know, prophetic remark. Um, and at Winchester, there's something called the DIV system, which is a, a general studies uh, where the, the don, the teacher, has a lot of latitude in, in what is read. And while um, Ian was at Winchester, one of the books he read uh, at the recommendation of his housemaster was uh, William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, um, which is a seminal book of Gifford Lectures from Edinburgh University. 1901-1902 and so Ian read this when he was probably about 16 um, Rupert didn't get round to reading it until quite a bit later and uh, and just yesterday I've been corresponding with uh, a former pupil who's also a scholar at Winchester Professor Ben Morrison and Ben is now the chair of philosophy at Princeton and my first encounter with him um, was that uh, Simon Elliott uh, one of my friends who was a Don as well, he sent him round uh, with a six-page essay, aged 14, entitled, Does God Exist? 
and and uh, he went through the the usual arguments and so i pointed him in the direction of william james and lent him a copy of varieties of religious experience which he pr proceeded to read uh, and then we we discussed it and then uh, rupert appeared uh, first in my um uh, horizon as it were at mystics and scientists 1983 when i was teaching at winchester and he was lecturing on his then new book or newish book a new science of life uh, and i gave him i gave him a spare copy of this book here uh, which is called talks to teacher on psychology and to students on some of life's ideals by william james and um, which i'm sure is still somewhere in rupert's library and then finally this book here is incredibly important. It's called Human Immortality. And, and um, it's the Ingersoll Lecture on um, uh, uh, Immortality, 1898, at Harvard University. And just to start um, Ian and Rupert off, I'm going to read a couple of short passages from the conclusion of Variety's Religious Experience. And, and uh, this is my paperback copy i read it when i was 26 and i remember um, reading part of it in the beautiful gardens in marburg so he says summing up in the broadest possible way the characteristics of the religious life as we have found them it includes the following beliefs one that the visible world is part of a more spiritual universe from which it draws its chief significance two that union or harmonious relation with that higher universe is our true end. Three, that prayer or inner communion with the spirit thereof, be that spirit God or law, is a process wherein work is really done and spiritual energy flows in and produces effects, psychological or material, uh, within the phenomenal world. And then another very short piece um, on the self. Um, uh, we have in the fact that the conscious person is continuous with a wider self through which saving experiences come, a positive content of religious experience, which it seems to me is literally and objectively true as far as it goes. And the other thing I just wanted to observe about um, Rupert and Ian is that they are both voracious readers and they have read widely and deeply all their lives. Um, and their libraries are pretty impressive. Uh, I have a fairly impressive library as well. So between us, I think we we, we uh, span uh, a considerable range. And so I'm going to hand over um, to you, Ian and okay. Rupert. And I think, yeah. Ian, you were going to um, open the batting, as it were. OK, yes, yes, that's yeah. good. <laughs> I, I should um, re refer to Schopenhauer's view that never read books. Reading books is for people who've got no ideas of their own. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, we, Can we let, spotlight uh, Ian, please, uh, and, and Rupert? Just wait till Rupert appears on the screen. Uh, there That's we are. It. Yes. Great, thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> is I'm speaking from the bedroom of the daughter of a friend in a flat in London. Um, <clears throat> and um, yes, it, it's hard to get my, my, my I, I feel so, um, so much that I belong where I live, that it's quite hard to sort of reconstitute my mental world here for the moment. But I think what I want to say is that I've become more and more convinced that none of the things that we desperately need to do to solve the various problems that we we we, we uh, face and that we talk about a great deal, none of this in the end will matter unless we are able to get back to the spiritual ground of our being. And in other words, we could, by some sort of a miracle, we could we could reverse the pollution of the seas, we could perhaps um, do something to at least slow climate change, we could um, uh, make it harder for people to carry on felling ancient forests. All, all this I believe in powerfully, but I also think that none of it will add up to a hill of beans unless we re-engage with the spiritual basis of a human life. I don't think we any longer 
know what it is to be a human being. I think people haven't the foggiest idea of what they're doing here, what the, the cosmos in which they come into being is like, um, and what their relationship with the earth that is their home uh, is like. Um, and and I'm just going to say a few things, Rupert, and then ask you to, to respond to them, really. In the new book I wrote, um, The Matter With Things, it, I, I suggest, uh, first of all, that many of the ways in which we look at the the constitution of the cosmos are upside down or back to front so in other words we we, we tend to think for example that the first of all there are things and then there are relations between them some of which we make in our minds and that's the way it is whereas i argue throughout a very long book that in fact relations are absolutely primary there is nothing that truly exists that is not a relation and is not in fact in process as whitehead um pointed out um so in other words relations and processes are primary not stasis and things and i also believe that for example it's not that there's literal truth and that's really the important thing and metaphorical truths are are just some kind of semi um, imaginary uh, extension of literal truth in fact i believe that all fundamental truths are metaphorical in nature and that literal truth is just a very special kind that we've invented to describe a small subset of things that occur at a very um, everyday level. But I, for the purposes of what we're talking about now, I want to suggest that it's not that somehow there is inanimacy and then there is life and then there is consciousness and then there is a sense of the great values, goodness, beauty, truth, and the sacred. I think it's the other way around, that what actually exists fundamentally is a consciousness, which is a field of consciousness, which is divine, which, which has the qualities of attending to and drawing us towards goodness, beauty, and truth, and the sense of the holy and sacred. And that it's for this that we've developed our complexity as human beings, since we are not better than animals, but we are, in this sense, above them, that we can, we can hope to respond to, to receive, to resonate with, and to give a full and fulfilling response to those leading values that draw us forward. So that's the way I would like to think of it, Rupert. Um, what would you say to that? Well, I think of it in a very similar way, and so do most people in the world, for that matter. Um, if you actually look at, and um, we live in a particularly godless part of the world, Western Europe, yes. um, but it's not quite the same if you go to Africa or India um, or many other parts of the world, or the or, or Iraq or you know, Iran, or I mean the Middle East, um, most people are religious in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, this kind of secularist, secular humanist, atheist tinted culture that we have um, is, is a historical anomaly. Uh, most people were religious in, in Europe in, in as Charles Taylor in his wonderful book, uh, you know, A Secular Age, points out in the year 1500 in Europe, um, everyone believed in God, everyone believed in the kind of vision you've just put forward. It was almost impossible not to, not because people were coerced into believing that, but because there was just no credible alternative. Mm. And um, what's happened is through the growth of, the, first through the Protestant Reformation, and the disenchantment of the world that happened in part through the Protestant Reformation, um, a, a lack of emphasis on nature, a focus entirely on human consciousness, and then through the scientific revolution, the mechanistic materialist worldview um, that's grown out of it, um, we now have this very secular world where people think that evolution and life starts from the bottom up, you know, from genes and molecules and cells. and um, everything builds up until you've got big enough brains where the light of consciousness mysteriously comes on. <laughs> and um, uh, then we start thinking about 
bigger things like God, but they're all just inventions inside our own minds and hence inside our own brains. And you'd be able to tell us exactly where. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't, Rupert, no. <laughs> so, uh, um, that, I mean, this, this uh, what both you and I are discussing and what, in fact, the whole scientific medical network has been concerned with right from the start is, you know, trying to find a, a way back to a worldview that is in, is still consonant with science, because science isn't going to go away. And we've learned a great many things about nature through the scientific process. Uh, but to recover a sense of this connection, which is actually there in all traditions, I mean, shamanic traditions, all admit that there's a, or all just assume that there's some realm they have different views of it, but there are realms beyond our own that what we see is not all there is. Indeed. And as my main teacher, Father Bede Griffiths, uh, used to point out that, you know, the center of all religious and spiritual culture is um, a direct experience of our minds, our consciousness being part of something vastly greater than ourselves. And as he pointed out, all religions start from that experience it's not a dogma it's an experience and then they interpret it I and mean, his favorite metaphor was the hand and you know that sort of central experience of unity is like the palm of the hand and then it's interpreted in different cultures in different traditions different languages they like the fingers of the hand all the different interpretations of this primary unity of uh, experience mm -hmm. this sense of ultimate unity which are interpreted in all these different cultural ways but that is the central foundation of all these religious traditions and as far as we know this intuition that we're part of something greater than ourselves is very ancient i mean all these cave paintings from 20 30 40 000 years ago um mm. the practice of burying the dead and so on all the or dealing with the dead in a ritual way all these things suggest that this has been part of human consciousness for a very, very long time. No doubt the forms have changed and the development of the great religions has sort of put a more unifying aspect on these insights. But it seems to me that it's been foundational to human life for throughout almost all human history with the brief anomaly of Western Europe and parts of North America in the last 150 years. Yes, of course, and it is it, it, worth reflecting on the fact that it would be entirely irrational to suppose that we were aware of everything in the cosmos. Why on earth would we? I mean, we know in the very simplest level that there are sounds that we can't hear, but that bears and bats can hear. So uh, what we know is limited by our, our senses and by um, the relative unsophistication of our brains. I say relative because relative to what there is for us to approach. Uh, if one has any kind of um, sense of imagination, one can see that um, things that we sense are there and that, as you say, throughout the world people have believed are there. This is not irrational. This is a very reasonable supposition. And there are people in, for example, Australia, the native people there who who say they can hear and see things at a distance, they can hear people, ancestors speaking to them, and who are we, frankly, to say that they don't hear those things? I like the, I think, I'm sure you would agree, the very important idea of Goethe's that we develop senses to perceive things in response to the in the the, the bits of experience that we we are able to 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 get um, and that therefore if we don't actually allow ourselves to experience certain things then an organ that we might have will atrophy and i suggest that uh, we've allowed uh, organs that would help us to see these things and hear these things and know these things we've allowed them to atrophy and that people that we consider more primitive than us and indeed our own children up to an age before they're um, they're told that it's not it's not wise or intelligent to say that you see these things of you're, you're fantasizing I mean, the, these people have the organs of perception that we need in order to 
to to reach the divine or, or to have any inklings of it. And I suppose that we all have enough of an inkling of that, that unless we shut it down, we can follow it and one hopes to grow it. You know, Keats called this world a veil of soul making. And in other words, we are, we are nourishing or, or stunting the soul by the way in which we live. Yes, well, I think the, um, the one way of looking at it is um, Charles Taylor suggests that in, uh, in Europe, in say up until 1500 or later, people had the idea that minds are porous. Uh, porosity is yeah. a word he uses. And the anthropologist Tanya Lerman, uh, who's at Stanford, um, is, I think, one of the most interesting anthropologists of religion writing at the moment. And in her latest paper, she talks about porosity. In all religions, it's assumed that our minds are porous to influences from each other, influences from spirits, gods, angels, other beings, that um, our minds are, are porous. And what Charles Taylor shows is that since the 17th century, there, there's been this shutting down. Uh, so the idea we've un, uh, end up, ended up with is our minds are completely insulated with inside the privacy of our skulls. Um, mm -hmm. They're nothing but the electrical activity of our brains or other activities of the brains inside our heads. And they're all separated off from everything else. Um, yes. They're completely privatized. Um, yes. And what Tanya Lerman shows is that it, she wrote that her most recent book is called How God Becomes Real. And, and the previous one was called How God Talks Back. Um, and she's done anthropological studies of charismatic Christians, you know, evangelical groups, women, women praying in Tehran, Muslim women praying in Tehran, uh, shamanic cultures and so forth. She's done, uh, uh, and she shows that in all these uh, traditions, there's the idea that we're open to spirits or beings of other kinds. Mm -hmm. But she also points out that this um, is actually something that requires a cultural reinforcement and effort on our, on our part. You know, if you believe in God, it's not just a kind of passive belief, but people who believe in God pray, uh, they go to temples, churches, services, they meet with others, they pray together, they have uh, cer annual ceremonies, rituals, practices, etc. There's a lot of work goes into um, making these beliefs more apparent and more de uh, directly experienced. And I think something similar happens with uh, people uh, have to put in quite a lot of work to maintain the secular worldview, to maintain the <laughs> yes. secular atheist worldview, denying all these things involves quite exactly. a lot of work, hard work on denial. You first exactly. of all have to deny uh, all your own telepathic experiences, and 85% of people have these experiences with telepathic telephone calls. You have oh. to deny uh, that you can really tell when someone's staring at you from behind, and 95% of people have experienced that. You have to deny that you have flashes of insight or mystical experience that appear to connect you with a consciousness greater than your own. If you take psychedelics, which give a wonderful sense of connection with something greater than yourself, you have to deny that that's real. Uh, uh, but you just have to say, well, that's just because chemical disturbances inside the brain. Um, so even atheism and, and secularism require quite a lot of effort in, in denial. Um, yes. <coughs> and the motive for the denial, I suppose, is fitting in with the secular world. And uh, what the, the only positive side of it all is a, a self-congratulatory feeling you're smarter than everyone else because you've mm. seen through all these false beliefs and childish attitudes that children have and so-called primitive people do. And mm. When, when you were reading the varieties of religious experience at school, I had a housemaster who uh, he was uh, you know, tried to show me the limitations of the Orthodox Christianity in which the, the school chapel, uh, we, we all had to go there every day. And, um, and I was reading bits of um, J.G. Fraser's The Golden Bough and Robert yeah. 
Christ, like goddess. Um, yes, indeed. His aim was to prove to me that Christianity was no better than these primitive superstitious beliefs found all over the world. Um, and uh, uh, and since we were quite happy to dismiss all of them as mumbo jumbo, the same applied to Christianity. It was no better than them. And, and at first I was persuaded, I thought this was an appalling weakness because it presumed to be superior to these other group mm. beliefs. And, uh, I've later come to see this as tremendous strength, that it has mm. so much in common with yeah, myths religion. and archetypal patterns found all over the world. Um, yeah. But the, 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 yeah. the idea that we're smarter than others, I mean, Fraser and all those late 19th century figures, early 20th century figures, had the view that we've risen above the sort of animistic superstition, and then you get religion, which is a bit better, not much better. And then you go beyond that to science, and then you realize all that stuff, basically childish rubbish we've grown out of. Um, so I think that that's how we've got here. And yes. I think it does take quite a lot of effort, as I say, for people to maintain that belief. And yes. I suppose that um, you would map some of this, I'm just guessing, uh, onto activities of different parts of the brain. Um, Yes, maybe. I mean, before we go there, though, <laughs> you raised a number of <laughs> we, 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 you, you raised a number of a number of interesting points. Um, in, I, I argue also in my chapter um, twenty eight of the matter with things of the sense of the sacred um, from evidence. Uh, given by psychological studies is actually it takes more effort to deny is it's not true that as, as Dawkins suggests that we are indoctrinated into religion in fact it's the opposite that it takes um, more cognitive effort to to inhibit these these ideas that doesn't mean that they're wrong of course um, but it, it is interesting that if you have people and maybe that is to do with the uh, the brain <laughs> that that some people especially people with autism um and uh who are something like a, a 10 times more likely to be atheistic um the normal brain is actually allowing us to if we will not suppress it to experience the sort of things that you're talking about and you know going back to my idea that the the things that we think are primary are not uh, and the things that we think are secondary are, are not so in the case of oneness you were talking about how we have to you know go back to an idea of being porous but this is this is a, as you as you're suggesting i think this is the natural state to see ourselves as in connection with the world um and you get in panpsychism a very interesting phenomenon which is that people people say okay so how do we okay maybe the logical position since we can't see how to get um, consciousness out of mere lump and matter maybe the answer is everything's got consciousness in it but then how do we recompose it you know how do we put this together it's actually called the combination problem this is typical of the left hemisphere which having first of all ruptured a unity then doesn't know how to quote recreate the unity but the unity is there the unity is primary um not not a secondary phenomenon that has to be put together and achieved um, so I think that that kind of panpsychism is is somewhat irrational and, and left hemisphere dominated. Now you I, you've brought me to the position where, of course, I've mentioned hemispheres, <laughs> and, and uh, I should say to anybody listening that my position is not that the brain um, creates our experience at all. Um, I, I say that logically there are three possibilities: the brain either emits experience, or it um, transmits experience. Or it permits experience, and and I I believe that in fact the brain is a permitter of experience that shapes it, uh, much as the vocal cords, as William James pointed out, are what shape his voice, a restriction, a constriction, an inhibition, a negation, some kind of molding or um, no saying to the breath that would come through. If there was no such um, molding or permitting, then there would be no voice at all. But coming to 
the boring stuff about <laughs> brain correlates. We do know that, um, I'm afraid it just is a matter of, of, of fact, and I give, I think it's Appendix 7 or something in, in, in uh, the matter with things. I, I do go over the science on hemisphere difference in spirituality in relation to um, mindfulness, uh, meditation in general, um, and shamanism, uh, religious experiences of certain kinds. And the overwhelming evidence is that this requires a shift of balance away from the normal slight uh, bias towards the left hemisphere. Um, it, it, in these experiences, one finds that this imbalance, if you like, is redressed, and not only redressed, but that the centers um, that are subtending these kinds of experience are um, very clearly um, right hemisphere related. So in a culture which I believe promotes the values of the left hemisphere, sees the world as particulate, made up of isolated things that are fixed, um, that are unchanging, uh, inanimate, abstracted, explicit, uh, there is no room for this kind of um, this kind of experience. Indeed, I was talking yesterday to clergy in Canterbury, um, and I don't know what they thought of it, but I was trying to explain that all the sort of things that you need in order to open your mind to the existence of a divine being are militated against by the natural mode of the left hemisphere, which is to pin things down, to look for certainty, um, to uh, focus on the explicit rather than the implicit, to see things as naturally inanimate rather than animate, uh, and to be all the time cataloguing and charting experience as on a map or having a theory about it, rather than actually allowing experience to come to you. To do that, you've got to have an opposite cast of mind, which is in fact the cast of mind that the right hemisphere enables for us in daily life, which is the the voice of a, um, a, a way of seeing things which in which there is no final certainty. There are things that are probable, and there are things that are more likely than others, but there's no final certainty. Nothing is finally separated from anything else. Uh, nothing is ever completely fixed. It's always uh, moving, changing and flowing. Um, all the really important stuff cannot be put into language. Uh, anybody who's been in love knows how incredibly feeble the language is to deal with this extraordinary experience. Um, and of course, any of you who are listening who are um, uh, um, persuaded that there is a spiritual realm, a divine realm that you can um, have in, intimations of, this again is beyond conceptual um, reduction in language. Um, the, the right hemisphere enables us to be more willing to accept paradox, um, to accept things that are not certain, and this is the realm where we, um, where we find the, the spiritual life. Yes, the the sense of not certainty, I mean, the, there is a sense, the sense though in some spiritual experiences where there is a great certainty. I mean, mm. for example, people who've had near-death experiences or mm. mystical experiences spontaneously or as a result of spiritual practices or mm. as a result of psychedelics. Mm. Um, there, I mean, I myself, when I've had some of these types of experiences, one of the things that people say about them is that you know that it's real, that it's, mm, it's mm. more real than nor nor normal reality. Sure, sure. Near-death experiences, which change, which last a few minutes, um, mm. change people's lives uh, mm. because they feel they've contacted a realm, a reality, which is more real, more certain in a way than the ordinary world we live in. And they don't have any doubt that there's this mm. spiritual reality because they've directly experienced it. Now, I don't know whether that, where, to what extent that depends on one or both hemispheres or whether it goes beyond mm -hmm. uh, the, the brain altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, I, from what's so convincing for many people about these experiences is precisely that they seem unquestionably real. Yes, I, I raises two points really. One is this, um, I would make a distinction between the absolutely certain and an asymptotic approach to certainty. 
and the left hemisphere has a category of things that are yes and no. And I don't think that experience, well, not in my experience, there is ever this, I'm not lucky enough to have had one of these experiences, but I imagine if I'd had one, I'd say I'm almost as certain of this as I can be of anything, which is different from um, claiming absolute certainty or absolute truth. But the other thing about it is something that my housemaster, Martin Scott, the man who really modelled for me the the wonderful relation between a man who was profoundly sane, very funny, um, hyper alert to the ridiculous, was also a deeply spiritual and, and in that sense a very serious person. And he, he modelled and conveyed to me that that way of looking at things. And, and one of the things he emphasised to me was that the, the true religious experience is not really about these moments of certainty or about, you know, levitating or seeing the future or any of these things. Nice as they may be, they are not the centre of it. And that, in fact, they're not particularly prized by the mystics who had these experiences and not particularly prized, actually, by the um, Buddhist masters. Uh, they they don't think that these amazing transformative experiences are really what it's about. Um, but it's typical of our society that we would imagine that there is an experience of this kind. And it's not about a more humble application uh, of a kind of disposition towards the world, which is one of awe and, and um, humility. Uh, and compassion, uh, which I believe is at the centre of it. So I'm not disrespecting extraordinary experiences. I, I'm just saying that I, I, I'm I'm a sceptic amongst believers, and I'm a believer among sceptics. I've always been like this. And and I, 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 I and when people do this, I find myself suddenly ru running to the other um, uh, part of the balance here to sort of keep things uh, properly in perspective. Well, speaking from my own experience, I've had these moments of insight where I've just known that there's a, a greater consciousness than, than oh, the normal oh. experience. But on a day-to-day, -day, I mean, those, those are quite rare, those experiences, yeah. like, not like every day. And yeah. that's where spiritual practices come in. Um, and I myself meditate in the mornings and I pray in the evenings. Um, and I see these as different daily ways of relating um, I see the meditation I think of as more like breathing in and I close my eyes, I try not to be occupied with the things in, in, in my room or uh, wherever I'm doing it, mm. then of course, I have a mantra, so I concentrate on the mantra um, and sit quietly and thoughts go through my mind and so on. And, and so it's a way of withdrawing not only from the outer world but also from the inner world of the default mode network of constant inner chatter what well, it still goes on but you detach from it and you just let it pass and so on. so that's like i think like breathing in whereas prayer i experience in is almost the opposite direction petitionary prayer uh, you start with an invocation or prayers start with an invocation our father who art in heaven hail mary full of grace om namah shivaya O Allah, you start with an invocation to uh, uh, being grace in yourself, a form of consciousness, grace in yourself. And then in petitionary prayer, where you're asking for things, which is the most common or common or garden form of prayer, I mean, basic found all over the world in all different traditions. Um, you then direct intention towards things that in the outer world, you know, someone who's sick, a problem, uh, that you're worried about, you know, some threat, you want to pray for protection or defense. And so it's very practical about the affairs of everyday life and, and the immediate problems in one's life. So in that sense, it's like breathing out. It's going from a spiritual center towards the outer world, uh, towards actual particular problems. And so I see these as both ways of, I see them as complementary to each other mm. and breathing in mm. and breathing out metaphor um, is is shows I mean we can only breathe out because we breathe in and vice versa so uh, yeah. you have the flow in both directions mm. but these I meditations like mm. a way of coming to a center within oneself where one's consciousness is 
connected to, or one can sometimes experience this connection to a greater ground of being or consciousness. Mm, and then mm. praying, this connecting that center to uh, the affairs of the world. Both of these increase the sense of porosity, the idea that one's consciousness is related to something greater, and also that the everyday affairs that one's concerned with and the problems in the world and uh, hopes and fears and all that are related to something greater than oneself as well. And I think that everyone who prays, and it's in, if you take the whole world, most people pray. Even if you take Britain, uh, mm -hmm. far more people pray than, uh, than actually go to church or have regular religious mm -hmm. practices. Um, I think these are ways in which, on an everyday basis, we have a greater sense of this connection. Well, I, li I like very much that image of breathing in and breathing out, naturally. Um, and I don't, I don't in any way deny your experience, but I, I am also immediately reminded of St. Francis's admonition that when you pray, you should ask for nothing, nothing. He's very emphatic about it. I think Mother Teresa said much of the same thing. And I remember the words of the infant Samuel, was it, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. When one's praying, it's more about listening than talking. But it doesn't mean that one doesn't remember people that one cares for and cares about. It would be odd and, and counterintuitive uh, to do that. So I think one bears them in one's, in one's mind, in one's care, and one commends that to God. If one asks for anything, one has to, after all, uh, couch that with the words, you know, if if it so be your will, you know. That, 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 I, 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 I do ask for things, I suppose, but I'm, I'm slightly conflicted ab about it. I think that the greater part of praying is actually creating a space in which something can come to you. Indeed, I think all creation and imagination is not about going out and doing something, but about creating a space for something to to happen. Um, as I often say, a gardener can't make a plant. All the gardener can do is create, <laughs> create a, a space for the plant to flourish or stifle the plant. But the plant has its own existence. And I think that whatever the spirit, the, the divine spirit, is trying to bring to us, we crowd out with our own um, our own desires, our own wishes, our own formulations, and that um, being being open is about creating a space for things to happen. I'm going to just mention here this extraordinary notion of the creation uh, that comes from the Lurianic Kabbalah, the, the prime being, the ground of being, ends off um, being relational, as God is and as love is, needs a creation. Um, to return that love, to be the object of that love, and to uh, and to realize the relationship with the loved one, which must be free. And so, what is the first act of Ains off in creation? It's something called Sim Sum, which means withdrawal, and that is a withdrawal to make a space in which there can be something other than this creature, this ground of being, not a creature. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are. Uh, urns that are, there are 12 of them that are in this space to catch whatever it is that comes out of veins off. And a single spark of fire comes out of veins off and lands on these vessels and, and shatters most of them. Um, and, and the third act of creation is it's called um, tikkun, which means repair. And this is the particular honor, duty, um, purpose indeed of humanity is to repair these shattered vessels and to make them more beautiful than they were before. Uh, and in that image, I, I think of this Japanese art of ceramics called Kintsugi in which you repair a shattered vessel, but it's more beautiful than it was before, often repaired with lines of gilt. Uh, the, of gold <laughs> that come into the ceramics. So this idea of creating a space for things to happen, drawing back and being unknowing and undoing is, is I think, very important. Well, I, personally, I see that as more the role of meditation. I mean, there are various forms of prayer. 
um, contemplative prayer or meditation is mm. creating a space. And yes. when I'm meditating, um, quite often, I mean, I'm not meditating in order to have sort of ideas, but quite often ideas pop into my mind about yes. things, the work I'm doing, ideas, scientific experiments, and so forth. Um, but petitionary prayer, I mean, there's an amazing range of opinions. I used to belong to a group called the Epiphany Philosophers in Cambridge, and we had retreats together. We had Easter vigils, and we had masses at, at various times of the year, which uh, the, the priest who celebrated them for us at one stage was Rowan Williams, um, who was a member of this group. Um, and once uh, I was thinking about prayer and I, we prayed together, we did the matins and even song every day together when we were on retreats. Um, and I then said, well, could we go around the circle? We all knew each other very well and just say something about how we ourselves prayed. And it was astonishing. I, I had just no idea that these people I'd prayed with many times saw it so differently. Some thought that we shouldn't ever pray for anything specific, a bit like you, you know, could hold people before God and or hold them in the light of God, but not tell God what to do, because God already knew everything. That, uh, so uh, absolutely uh, not right to do that. Um, others prayed very, very specifically, um, as Jesus does in the, in the New Testament. And Jesus is not just holding people, specifically curing specific people. He didn't cure everybody when he walked into the room. He'd cure one person at a time and with a particular personal uh, sort of act of healing. Or, um, so uh, it was much, it was really quite specific. And so there was a wide range of opinion about how specific we should be. And those who believed in the specificity would say it's not telling God what to do, it's being co-creators with the divine that yes. God works through us. Uh, an idea similar to what you just said, God works through us. And exactly. he asks for God's guidance in our prayers. We're not just coming up with ideas of I, I want to have a, a new car or I'd, I'd like to have more money or something like that. It's a, it's not like a God in prayer is like yes. a celestial Amazon with yes. delivery yes. the next day. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I remember uh, yes, um, a, a, a joke about that. Um, I prayed for a new bicycle, but then I realized God doesn't work like that. So I stole a bicycle and prayed for forgiveness. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do, um, I, I, you see, I'm trying to hold together two uncertainties, which is always my problem. I, 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 I really respect what you're saying. And of course, whether you call it prayer that, that caused Christ to heal people or something else, I don't know. But as C.S. Lewis pointed out, the idea that prayer will produce the outcome we desire can be completely uh, dispensed with because the holiest of all petitioners uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, prayed three times for this cup to be taken from him, and it simply wasn't. So we can uh, we can assume that this is not the way that prayer does work. Having said that, I I, I believe that uh, disposing one's mind towards an outcome and disposing many people's uh, minds towards an outcome may help that outcome come about. I don't know quite how. And it may be by modes that you're more articulate about that we call parapsychological, but are um, probably entirely natural. Yes, I think forming the, the intention, you see, is, is part of this co-creation. Mm, mm. And I think the power of praying together, I mean, I'm a regular church goer because I like praying together. I like singing together and I like being yeah. in a holy place with members yeah. of Community who pray together. Yeah. So I go wherever I am on Sundays in small village churches, on local parish church here in Hampstead, or wherever I am. Yeah. Uh, so I think that creating of an intention together is very, very important. Um, and of course, the the secularized version of prayer and intention is positive thinking, which oh. is huge in America. Yeah. I know. For a hundred years or more, there have been all these books on the power of positive thinking. Yeah, and, I know. Um, you know. Where you form an intention, you know, and then to sell more vacuum cleaners or encyclopedias, <laughs> and then you, so you, you sell more because you formed the intention. Mm -hmm. And one of the most uh, 
perverse examples of positive thinking is, of course, the former president, Donald Trump, who was raised in the Church of Positive Thinking. Um, the, the, um, the chap who was the prophet of positive thinking, what's he called, Norman, uh, I've forgotten the, the name for the moment, but the, the power yeah. of positive thinking. I don't have anything to do with these pop psychologists. Eh? Norman Vincent <laughs> Peale. Oh, yes, Norman Vincent Peale, that's right. Okay, um, I did. Who's, you know, the power of positive thinking. He was the minister of something called the Marble Church in Manhattan, where Trump's family went. And as a teenager, Trump imbi 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 imbibed all this. Norman Vincent Peale married him to his first wife. So he was absolutely raised in formative yeah, years yeah. on positive thinking. And the idea is you just say something and you can make it come true through power of intention. So he loses the election. So he says he's won it. Um, you know, this is pure positive thinking <laughs> taken to its most illogical but, extreme. In, in my terms, it's pure left hemisphere thinking because the left hemisphere and believes that it has power to create the outcome it wants and is always an optimism optimist and if something doesn't work out the way it believes it will deny that black is is black it will it will say um a paralyzed limb is such that they can use it freely and and so it's power to deny reality in order to fit in with its theory about reality is the defining feature of it and i would say that you know yes. Trumpism is, is just an expression of this mentality and not one that I particularly want to take as my guide. Oh, I certainly don't. I mean, <laughs> point, no, the no. point about it is, you see, that it's it's a kind of debased or secularized form. Yes, I, I know yeah. what you're saying. Uh, yeah. It's it's about getting what you want. Um, yes, through positive yes. thinking, you have success in love and business mm. um, through positive thinking. That's why these books sell so well. You know, they're mm. all about selling more of the product and, and mm. getting ahead yeah. and, and so yes, forth. Yes. And the uh, yeah. principle mm. that forming intentions can actually have effects in the world. But mm. the point about proper prayer, uh, for positive thinking is about me getting what I want through the power of my mind. Mm. And it's where the left hemisphere goes magical, as it mm. were or uh, mm. attempts to, um, mm. whereas the normal prayer, I mean, I myself being a Christian, always start my prayers with the Lord's Prayer, and mm. part of that is right at the beginning, is thy will be done. So it's prayer in a much, as you were mentioning, into a much larger context of God's will and the, the larger purposes of which I'm yes. a part, and, and I, I play a part within that larger pattern. But um, if you, and I suppose that would be more like a right hemisphere thing, because it's part of a global vision of what's mm. happening in the world. But mm. then you could say the secularization of prayer, um, by it, it removes the right hemisphere aspect until it becomes mm. left hemisphere activity. But I think yeah. positive thinking can't be understood as a movement or a practice without its background in petitionary prayer, from which it's kind of truncated der derivative. Yes. No, I think that's fine. I don't think we need to to disagree too much about this. Um, I mean, I suppose that the touchstone for me is the is the Holocaust. I mean, all these innocent people and innocent children treated with utmost barbarity. And do you suppose that the decent people, Jews, Christians and others did not pray? that they should be spared this, but they weren't. So, you know, that, that is a, I, I can, I can, there is a theodicy, I, I think, which is simply that whatever God is, God has to allow his creation freedom. Otherwise, it's simply an extension of himself and it's not a, another that he, he can love. It is not a creation. So uh, that, and that, that creation must have the, the freedom to do um, good or ill. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the time we do evil. Anyway, let's talk about many other things, uh, you know, as the walrus said. Um, what, 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 what shall we, should we move to panpsychism, or, or would you like to talk about consciousness and matter, or, or the nature of time, or, or where should we go? <laughs> well, I think while we're on consciousness and uh, I think one, the view that you started with, you know, our present bottom up view, I mean, the traditional view is the opposite, that yeah. it starts with consciousness, that consciousness underlies all things. Mm. Um, and then the whole of nature is produced through consciousness. Um, you know, in, in the Christian version, 
in the creed it says that the cosmic Christ, you know, through him all things were made. Um, that there's a part of the divine, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Logos, which mm. is the realm of names and forms. It is, yes, yes, it's yes. through all creation is divinely or, or comes forth from an ultimate source of form and structure. Yeah. That mm. everything in that sense shares within the divine consciousness. God is in nature, nature is in yes. God. Um, and that is not panpsychism, but panentheism, the, the idea that God is everywhere in nature and that nature is in God. So God is, the mind of God transcends nature. It's not just nature because otherwise not. that's pantheism. Pantheism, yes, yes. yes. And so I think what we've got at the moment now coming to panpsychism is the, uh, this, uh, the main driver for modern panpsychism is to try and, as you said, to solve the hard problem. Because mm. the hard problem is that if you have a materialist view that the whole world is made up of unconscious yeah. matter and nothing else, um, there's no consciousness out there. Um, the only consciousness there is is inside brains. Mm. And um, moreover, mo the maximum amounts inside human brains and maybe lesser mm. amounts in dog brains and elephant brains and perhaps tiny amounts in worm brains or ant brains. Um, that, that, um, that consciousness is confined to brains. The entire universe is unconscious except on this planet. And it's unconscious on, on the entire planet except for the inside of human and animal heads. That's the standard view. Uh, but it has the problem then of saying, well, if the whole universe is unconscious, mass is unconscious, how come we're conscious? Everything ought to be unconscious. And then, as you know, a lot of philosophers of mind of materialist persuasion try to pretend we're not conscious. It's an illusion. It doesn't do anything. Um, mm -hmm. It's an epiphenomenon. phenomenon. Um, Ridiculous, yes. Let's try and get rid of consciousness. No. So the panpsychists, so, you know, the bright boy at the back of the class and, and, and among materialist philosophers of mind said, well, what if ever we say electrons and atoms are a bit conscious, then, mm -hmm. then uh, we can explain our consciousness mm -hmm. as a difference of degree, not of kind. But they usually end there. Uh, once they get to the human brain, um, they, they think they, they've made their point, and that's where panpsychism ends. Mm -hmm. But as you know, I've tried to carry this argument further in, in my paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, Is the Sun Conscious? Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to go with this panpsychist move and say, okay, well, let's say that there really is this kind of panpsychism. Then why stop at the human brain? The mm -hmm. Sun is a self organizing system. Mm -hmm vastly larger than our brains with vastly more complex electromagnetic patterns. Why can't the sun be conscious? Why can't other stars be conscious? And indeed whole galaxies with higher levels of consciousness um, and then clusters of galaxies and then the entire cosmos. And of course, this is not a new idea. Then Plato and Plotinus and many others talked about the world soul. Um, the the whole universe having a kind of soul, mind, or organizing principle. Um, and that would be a kind of pantheistic uh, global consciousness. But then the traditional view is that that itself is embedded within a larger, more inclusive source of consciousness, which is, in the end, the source of nature. But so panpsychism, as we currently have it, is a fairly limited form of panpsychism. It's a kind of materialist panpsychism which yeah. just attributes kind of epiphenomenal consciousness to material structures up to mm. and including the human brain. Yes. Yes, well, as you possibly know, I am a panentheist, and uh, it's a very different thing from being a pantheist. Um, but there is a way, in fact, of um, approaching what is meant by panpsychism further towards panentheism. And almost making it, um, making them a union. Um, if you start from the idea that there is separate stuff in the realm of matter and that you've got to find a union to it, um, uh, then you have this famous combination problem. But if you start from the view, as I do, that the, the, the ontological primitive is consciousness, there is nothing you can get beyond or behind. You can't go beyond or behind consciousness. Consciousness is the ultimate reality. I was asked yesterday by clergy, well, is consciousness God? And I suppose 
yes but no, because I don't want to sort of limit what God is, uh, rather in the panentheistic way, consciousness is a, a, a divine creation. Um, but what I see is that matter is a mode of manifestation of consciousness. So uh, at times it is um, it is something that is uh, uh, immaterial or appears to be, but we only know what we call material things uh, because we have consciousness. We don't know that we have consciousness because of material things such as brains, but we do know the one thing we can be certain of is consciousness, which is why it's so particularly annoying that um, people uh, are sitting on uh, well-paid and prestigious chairs in American universities claiming that consciousness is an illusion. But anyway, um, consciousness is the basic reality. And people say, well, matter doesn't look like consciousness. But then I suggest that we think about it as a phase of it in the way that um, ice is a phase of water. You know, water is translucent and flowing and so forth, but ice is, is static and opaque and extremely hard. Um, uh, so hard that it can split your head open. Where, and in this room, there is a, a, a tunnel more of, of water in the atmosphere, otherwise I couldn't breathe. So they don't look like one another, but which is the real water? They're all real water. And I think that there, is, there are all these ways in which consciousness can manifest. And one of them is in what we call matter. And why should there be matter? Well, I suggest there's matter because it provides two important things for creation. It provides, importantly, an element of resistance. Nothing can come into existence without there being some element of resistance or uh, something that moves against that, that trend of, of creation. I mean, you know, everything has this dual aspect. You, uh, what is friction? Friction stops movement, certainly, but it also starts movement. Without friction, you can't move. <laughs> and w without there being some uh, definition, which means literally the, the, the limits to things, there can't be the whole world that we experience with all its magical beauty and complexity. So it, it brings that degree of, of a resistance and it brings a degree of um, temporary permanence. In other words, um, the things I'm saying disappear um, as soon as I say them uh, or may linger in somebody's mind somewhere for a few seconds. But, you know, the desk at which I'm sitting will be here tomorrow, um, absent a world war. So um, th those are the ways I, I would see it. And that is completely consonant with what you were saying about the divine being what you were really saying is the divine is imminent and the divine is transcendent and it's holding those two together which we can in the form of the trinity trinity the trinity is the best explanation of panentheism that there is you know it's, it's like the image of um a, a book what is a book is it the thing in the mind of the creator or is it the the volume here on the table or is it what happens when that volume is taken up and read by somebody the book is all three of those but in different senses and this is what uh, rumi said in one of his meditations that um that it, the spirit is the well spring it is the cup that conveys the water and it is the water that quenches the thirst of those who are thirsty. So I, I just thought I'd throw that in because I think it's one way of making panpsychism a much more interesting phenomenon, a much closer to panentheism. I agree. I, I think that the best model of ultimate reality is Trinitarian, and we find it in yes. many different traditions. As uh, my yes. favorite book on this is David Bentley Hart's book, The Experience yes. of God Being yes. Consciousness Plus, where he shows that the an Indian model, Sat, Chit, Ananda, is, is one way of looking at this. I and mean, Sat is the ground of all being, that which sustains all things, all being. And Chit is consciousness, which is, uh, contains names and forms, Nama Rupa, names and forms, that the contents of consciousness has, is consciousness about things. And these names and forms, it's roughly what Plato called you know, the Platonic realm of ideas. Uh, in the Christian Trinity is the Logos. And then Ananda, joy or bliss, that the divine consciousness is blissful, which is why mystical experiences of union with God are usually blissful, because mm. the divine consciousness is blissful. Mm. And in the Christian model, where we have God the Father as the ground of being, and 
the Logos as the, the second person of the Trinity, the names and forms which give form, shape, structure, uh, uh, coherence to everything, which underlie the order and form of the world and also the order and form of our minds, which is why we can, the traditional view is why we can understand nature is because they have a common source, their minds yeah. and the natural world. Yeah. And then the Holy Spirit, which is the dynamical moving principle, wind, energy, breath, air, flames, mm. uh, flying birds, you know, it's the dynamical principle. Mm. I find that the when we understand matter as a, a combination of form and energy, with energy, according to physics, matter like an electron or a proton or an atom, are organized by quantum fields, which mm. give them their form. The energy within them is the same energy we see in light, and light can turn into matter, and matter can turn into light. Energy is promiscuous and can take any form. Um, so what we have in nature is a, a universal energy. This is a scientific view as well as a religious view. Um, and uh, we have a whole range of possible forms that energy can take. Um, and the source of both <coughs> energy is is the ultimate being and uh, the, the source of both and the primary metaphor is of course speaking because when i speak i'm the speaker um the words i'm saying have form structure shape connection with each other meaning mm. um, and but in order to say them i have to be breathing out there has to be a flow of air and if i have just the words they're silent in my mind if i have just the flow of air it's a kind of white noise of under, undifferentiated energy. But the two together make the words re, which can then relate and communicate and give structure and meaning. So I think that this metaphor, I find this particular metaphor of the Holy Trinity particularly helpful. Yes, yes. Well, I'm glad I, I would endorse every word of that. But I thought that we might segue from there to the relationship between energy and matter, we know that they're interchangeable and E equals MC squared is a, uh, the most famous expression of this idea. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in uh, your idea, um, which I believe will be adopted by mainstream science eventually when they catch up, which is that there are form fields of energy, possibly electromagnetic energy, which govern the shapes of things and are also the cause of memory. So there are memories that are stored in form fields. I, I believe this this is something that you would you might want to demur, but I think this is my understanding. Um, because, of course, I mean, I'm sure people are aware, but when we, we've done this heroic task of decoding the genome, you know, which I don't want to diminish in any way, it was a staggeringly um, clever um, and, and, and um, brilliant piece of work. But at the end of the day, what we discovered, there's almost nothing there. I mean, there's absolutely, there's not just n not quite enough information, as it were, but by many, many orders of magnitude, far, far too little. Most things are just simply not there. And it mm. reminds me slightly of that episode of um, Faulty Towers. I think it's number five of the first series where um, the chef gets drunk and um, Basil Faulty has to go off to a restaurant and, and get a duck for the, for the gala evening. And unfortunately, somebody sw switches the, the plates around. And so he takes away what he believes is a duck, but is in fact a blancmange. And he walks into the dining room with this sort of, <laughs> I've got it here now. <laughs> and then he goes, voila, takes off the lid. And there's a blancmange. And he goes, there's nothing there. And <laughs> I, I sort of see this as the state we're in now, that we, we thought we've got it, but actually it's not there. So. On a more serious note, you, you sent me a couple of papers that I very much enjoyed. Um, one of them was fairly technical, but it explained itself at the end. And what it was really saying is that the lowest level of neurons and uh, transmitters and so on, there is no stability or there is little stability, not enough stability to say that any kind of memory is stored in this pattern of neurons or whatever, because it shifts. It shifts in the brain after yes. a very short while. It may go somewhere else. So, but what is stable 
is not the manifestation in the brain substance, but some kind of electromagnetic field. Now, expand on that, Rupert, please. Well, um, I think both genes and uh, brains have long been overrated. Um, and in, in, the, in the 1970s and 80s, <laughs> it was assumed that genes would explain everything, which is why literally billions of dollars were poured into the Human Genome Project. Mm. As you say, when it came, when it finished, you know, they thought there'd be 100,000 genes that you'd be able to patent them and make a fortune and stuff. There are only 20,000 and, you know, rice plants have about 45,000 and see a, a few more than us. So it's not, uh, it's <laughs> not, it wasn't at all what was expected. And then all these attempts to explain hereditary in genome wide association studies where you compare tens of thousands of people's genomes and they look at their height and whether they get breast cancer, whether they you know, schizophrenic, etc. What do the genes actually explain? Well, they explain about 2.5% of the inheritance of schizophrenia, less than 10% of the inheritance of breast cancer, less than 20% of the inheritance of height. And yet, these things are known to be heritable. And um, so uh, the genes don't explain mm. it. So that's called the missing heritability problem mm. in the trade. Um, and um, they pe tried, people have tried to fill that gap with epigenetics, the inheritance of acquired characters, mm. which mm. was, as you know, taboo in the 20th century. Absolutely. Um, I think it depends on morphic resonance, the uh, connection of the, of the kind of memory across time, uh, mm. as you know, is one of my favorite theories. Um, yeah. And the, the same goes for memories in the brain, that morphic resonance depends on similarity. Any organism is more similar to itself in the past than to any other organism. Therefore, the most specific resonance is from its own past. And I think this maintains the form of organisms, even though the cells and the molecules turn over. I mean, our own molecules are changing all the time and cells coming and going, um, um, but the form remains more or less the same. And in the realm of uh, memory, I think that we resonate with ourselves in the past, and that's how memory works, that it's not you know, stored as the materialists believe. They, well, they have to believe that it's material in the brain because they've got nothing but material to explain things. And so it has to be material traces. And people have tried over and over and over again for more than 100 years to find these memory traces, storing memories in brains, and they've proved ever more elusive. And the paper you were referring to is where people have looked in mouse brains, inserting extremely detailed electrodes, so you can get tremendously fine grained picture of what's happening in the, in the brain. And we know that brains have waves going through them. It's not just granular nerve cell activity. It's, We've known from electroencephalographs for years that there are global wave patterns. What this new study shows is that these wave patterns are highly specific and very particular patterns of waves when a mouse learns something and when it remembers it. And when they first discovered the characteristic wave patterns, they said, oh, we've located the memory. Here they are, these waves in this bit of the brain that in between when learning and remembering, they must have been stored in the cells in material traces that somehow then come to life in the form of waves again. But then they found that the wave patterns remain the same when they remember it, the same pattern, but the pattern can move to different bits of the brain. It, it's, it's not in particular cells. It's, it's the ability of the nervous tissue to produce wave patterns that underlies the memory. And mm -hmm. this is called representational drift. Um, so, um, the, the standard theory of memory just doesn't work. And I think memory and the memory of form and the inheritance of form and instinct, I think instincts like habits of the species inherited by morphic resonance. Um, right. So I think that the, the, the standard materialist view trying to build it all up from granular genes oh. is simply falling apart through oh. the, you know, the, um, the inheritance problem. Um, the missing heritability problem and through things like representational drift and the failure to find memories in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, this, of course, has huge implications for consciousness because the materialist view is that when we die, if memories are all stored in the brain and the brain decays, then ever oblivion is the only possible outcome of death. Whereas mm -hmm. all traditional belief systems have had some sort of 
life after death, whether it's a shadowy uh, ancestral realm in Hades, or whether it's you know life after death, in May, or whether it's reincarnation. All of them involve a transfer or survival of memory beyond the survival beyond the death of the brain. All of those possibilities are ruled out by the materialist theory, which is why it so fits well with a kind of atheist worldview, um, because it rules out a lot of religion is about thinking about consciousness in the big picture, including the possibility of life after death, or whether it's that our consciousness is resorbed into the ultimate consciousness or whatever. Um, it they all assume most religions assume that it doesn't just stop when we die. Whereas the materialist theory of memory says that's the only possible option. Right, right. But am I right in understanding? I mean, I know you, like myself, have had conversations with Michael Levin, who is uh, an evolutionary biologist at Tufts. Um, I, I think you've had conversations with him, am yes. I right? Yes. Yes, and I went to visit him, actually. I, I admire yes. him. Again. A few years ago, when I was giving a talk at Harvard, I, I, I went to um, to visit him um, yes. and, and we, we spent some time together in his lab and that was a purely private conversation but, but did, um, did you find that there was um, that he had moved towards I, I, my sense is that he doesn't actually want to embrace it fully or publicly but that he basically is a deeply sympathetic to this way of thinking yes he is his his whole way of thinking is about holistic organizing principles, which yes. one call morphogenetic fields. That's exactly. my starting point. Um, he's, the, the, the great thrust of his work is that biology is organized by field, sort of top-down organization of the development exactly. of form and regeneration, rather than building it up from the bottom from genes, which simply mm. doesn't work. No. But there's a form of teleology or purposive behavior in all uh, living things, that there's a, a global organizing principles that are hierarchically organized, and you've got cells within tissues, and the cell has its own form of organization, its own intelligence, and the tissue containing millions of cells is a higher level of organization, and the organ a higher level still, and the organism and the society. Uh, this view is, is almost I mean, it's very similar to what I, I think. And mm. the one thing he doesn't have is morphic resonance, you see. Mm. And um, I, he certainly knows about it, because when I went to visit him, he pulled out a very well-thumbed copy of my book, A New Science of Life, my first mm. book about morphic resonance. He asked me to sign it. And, mm. and I, I know he's read it with great attention. And yes, yes. I mean, he's very widely read. I don't claim yes. that some special privilege, particularly for me, but or my book. But... Um, He's very widely read, but he's certainly very aware of the holistic tradition in biology, very rooted in it, and very well aware of its history. Um, you know, going back to the early 20th century, people like Driesch and, and, and yeah. the Vitalist School. I mean, he's yeah. very aware of that in a way that most biologists aren't. Oh, no. Um, and I think that he's hovering. I think he'd love yeah. morphic resonance to be true, but yeah. he doesn't mention it. He doesn't talk about it. He doesn't do research on it because he knows that this would. I mean, he's at present has a very <laughs> wonderfully influential position within biology. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's very rare. Uh, it's very rare for someone who has a holistic perspective to have such wide influence in yes. biology where molecular biology has dominated things for so long. If yes. he started coming out in favour of morphic resonance. Yeah, he'd be proclaimed a heretic like me, yes, yes, and yes. and the, the, this would fall apart. So, yes, yes, if somebody else got good yes. evidence for morphic resonance, yes. I think he'd be pleased, and I think he'd start doing work on it. But yes, I, don't I think he's yes. in a position where he could take the lead. Yes, uh, while well, you were talking about this intelligence of cells, you know, which is something I'm very interested in. I've written about in the matter with things. Um, even a single cell can inventively repair its own form, although it's not programmed anywhere in its genome to do so and has no experience itself of such a repair being needed. And in, in many ways, that's a small uh, element in a picture which is much bigger, which is 
you know, good point that I think was made by um, FSC Schiller uh, or FCS Schiller, uh, which is that when somebody's had a a brain injury, um, how is it that other parts of the brain sort of know that they need to reconstitute this element? It's it is entirely different from anything that a machine can do. Because it involves a conceptual pattern of the whole, where it recognizes there's something that needs to be brought into being, rather like the idea of a representational drift. That another part, although on a much bigger scale and more dramatically, that one another area of the brain must be recruited to do this job, and that suggests that there is a form of what is going on at a higher level, which is exactly what they're finding in in the brain science of um, memory that you are talking about. So I think that's that's wonderful. Yeah, that's why in the nineteen twenties, when the idea of morphogenetic fields was first put forward, uh, people liked the field idea because if there's a field organizing the development of a, an organism or a cell, and if you damage it, the field is still there, which contains yes. wholeness yeah. um, and uh, can account for regeneration. And the analogy was um, with magnetic fields, because mm. fields are intrinsically holistic, even the fields of physics. Yeah. Uh, and after all, fields were only introduced into science by Faraday in the 19th century, in the 1850s. Um, before that, it was just purely me mechanistic, you know, pushing and pulling, billiard balls and things. Um, although Newton's gravitational theory implied uh, interconnectedness of the entire mm. universe mm. but the emphasis in classical mechanics was on pushing and pulling yeah. and fields in a way are still involved in pushing and pulling but um that they're, they're through what in pulling working. than pushing i make a distinction i think that things that push from behind are very mechanistic and hydraulic but that actually what we need to be thinking about are those things both spiritually morally intellectually and biologically that draw us from in front well, yes, uh, of course, magnetic fields push or pull. If you put the same poles together, yes, they that's true. Yeah. Push. <laughs> but it's not symmetrical because if you shake up a whole lot of magnets, I sometimes do this for fun. Um, and, um, <laughs> they they automatically line up. They repel each other until they pull. And so <laughs> it's not that it repulsion attraction comes out above repulsion because you end up with a exactly. large uh, <laughs> interconnected magnet. You don't end up with lots of repelled separate ones. So, oh, God, I love that. <laughs> although repulsion and attraction are symmetrical in, the, in an iron yes. magnet, the net yes. result is the domination of attraction. And well, so that sounds a, <clears throat> a very good point in <clears throat> which to um, have a break. Um, okay. I have to sort of cut you off somewhere um, because the, <laughs> the conversation has been so wide ranging and fascinating that you brought things out of each other, um, which is probably, you know, new and fresh. And that's what I think 